Um, I'm Antti Charakara. I lead the computational x-ray science group at the APS. And today I'm going to talk about some of the ways that we're using high performance computing and AI to enable essentially new kinds of techniques and new kinds of um, science at the APS. So before I start, I want to emphasize I, um, that this is the work of a great many people. Um, I just happen to be the person presenting today um, from the uh, computational x-ray science group. So we're a diverse group of about 15 PhDs um, with expertise ranging from you know, applied math and signal processing um, to high performance computing, workflows, um, world-renowned crystallographers like Brian Toby and Bob Van Drill. And more recently, we've been hiring a lot of um, um, early career staff and postdocs who come to us with an expertise in uh, deep learning and automatic differentiation. I particularly want to highlight the work that I'm going to talk about today, particularly highlights the work of um, Tekin Baiser, Salgat Kandel, um, and Yudong Yao and Anaka Babu, who were former members of the group but have now moved on uh, to other opportunities. Outside of the CX6 group, um, I also want to acknowledge a lot of people at the APS, the Math and Computer Science Division, the Data Science and Learning Division, Center for Nanoscale Materials, um, folks at Lawrence Berkeley, um, and in NVIDIA as we start pushing more towards the hardware side of computing. And again, in particular, I want to highlight uh, Tao Zhou, who's a staff scientist at CNN, and Henry Chan, also a staff scientist at the Center for Nanoscale Materials. And funding for this came from um, lab-directed research at Argonne and from a Department of Energy um, project called AI at Scientific Use Facilities, Digital Twin for Silico Experiments. So I'm going to start out by talking about numbers, basically, essentially laying out kind of a business case for why AI. And talk about you know, some of the data and compute needs um, that we have today, what we expect in the near future. And I suspect a lot of this will be familiar to um, folks on Synchrotron and XFELs from around the world. And then I'll talk about a couple of examples of how we're using AI to address this. Um, the first more for, for analysis, we I'll show how we can use AI to make our analysis workflows um, hundreds of times faster and sometimes even uh, more accurate. And I'll show how this enables for the first time, you know, real time um, analysis on, um, on, on really high data streams, like gigabit per second data streams. And then I'll talk a little bit about how this in turn enables the ability to steer, intelligently steer experiments. Essentially the idea being, how do you maximize information gained from an experiment in a minimal amount of time? And then more longer term, we are interested in um, extracting knowledge autonomously from our scattering data. So essentially, how do you directly learn the physics without having to go through a, a multi-stage process of data inversion, um, you know, um, some, under some understanding of what that entails and how that relates to um, the physical questions that we're trying to answer. So um, just as a quick overview, if in, in case you're not uh, intimately familiar with the APS. Uh, we're pre-pandemic. We welcomed you know, users from um, around the world, academia, industry, and government. And we used, we used to see about you know, 6,000 users every year. We operate nearly 70 beamlines, all capable of independent operation, um, each providing a unique, unique take on materials characterization. And many of them are multimodal um, in nature. Um, and, and kind of that in turn implies that we need unique data workflows and compute solutions um, for each of these beamlines because each of them are unique, they're bespoke, um, and they're often more complex um, instruments than just one particular technique. So the primary motivation is data volumes. So for, for AI and for um, the strategy and how we're doing computing at APS. So this is a plot of um, the data produced by the APS over the last few years. So we're reaching in about 10 petabytes or so. And what the data will look like after we go down for our big upgrade and come back up. So we're going to see a massive increase in data. And if you look across at you know, different facilities, um, LCLS, or across the Department of Energy facilities um, in the US in total, we're going to see 10 to 100x increase in data rates. Um, Another way of looking at this is by looking at the sort of historical um, capabilities of instruments like this. So the curve in red shows the photon flux and you can consider photon flux as like a proxy for, for data rates. The curve in red shows the photon flux over the last um, you know, 60 years or so. 
And the curve in green is Moore's law. And Moore's law has been you know, slowing down and sort of flatlining here. And so what you can see is over the last 60 years or so, consistently the rate at which we're generating data at synchrotron facilities has been outpacing Moore's law. And this gap is going to continue to increase. And so we need essentially a new way of thinking about how we analyze data um, at our facilities. Just plugging in a bigger, bigger computer um, is not sustainable because of this increasing gap. And we do this. We now have a supercomputer plugged into some of our beamlines, and I'll talk briefly about it, but that's still not going to be sufficient for our needs. And so AI will become a necessity to fully exploit um, the instrumentation and the facility itself. Um, and as you're all um, very well aware, materials characterization very often um, involves a solution of some form of inverse problem, whether you're doing imaging or spectroscopy or diffraction or some combination of them. Um, you, have, you typically have to solve an inverse problem, and inverse problems are computationally expensive to solve. And then the third motivation is how we want to do science um, going forward. We want to solve problems. We want to study science that we don't, we can't do today. So, for example, we're interested in why materials fail catastrophically. Um, and you know, being able to study this means being able to image a material in action at multiple length scales. You know, starting from the nanoscale to the macro scale to see how to, to see the origin of failure in the material and how that um, evolves, grows, and leads to you know, a massive uh, failure on the component scale. If you want to do this, you need to have some form of automated steering of your experiment. Um, and you need essentially an AI you know, capable of making these decisions on uh, where, to, where to acquire data, what modality to acquire, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to do this, of course, then you need real-time data inversion, right? Even if the data takes 15 minutes or half an hour um, to be analyzed, that's too slow. Essentially, you need to be able to do data inversion on the order of seconds or less. So because of um, all of these challenges over the last couple of years or so, we have been essentially um, integrating high-performance computing resources at our um, leadership computing facility directly with beamlines and instruments um, at the APS. So Polaris is a top 20 supercomputer. And a portion of that machine, about four petaflops of that, of the, of that computer's uh, processing power is now being made um, available directly for use at the APS. And so we're building out software solutions um, that tackle a lot of inverse problems. So you know, things like tachography, um, XPCS, et cetera, um, energy diffraction microscopy, and many others. Um, are now directly utilizing these machines to do the analysis. Um, so data is moved directly uh, from the beamline to the instrument. You do some processing, you move that back for visualization analysis at the beamline. And this also includes um, deep learning training at scale um, and deploying at the edge, which I'm going to talk about specifically in the next few slides. So the examples that I'm going to talk a bit more in detail are um, in current imaging, because that's my background and I'm more personally involved with, in some of these projects. Um, so current imaging is going to be um, a big part of the APSU. There are going to be a large number of tachography beamlines. In addition to that, you're going to have beamlines to things like core and surface capturing, um, atomic, which is going to do um, 3D BRAC CDI, polar, doing polarization modulation spectroscopy, um, various checks beamlines, doing combinations of BRAC CDI, XPCS, et cetera, um, high energy um, 3D BRAC CDI, um, and the sector nano, the 26 nano probe, which will be doing 3D Bragg typography. So a great number of um, coherent um, imaging beamlines at the APS, and all of these are going to essentially um, rely on us um, being able to do the data analysis um, in, in, in the case of coherent imaging, phase retrieval um, very quickly and accurately. So again, just to give you kind of an idea of how much of a jump in, in capability this is, um, I think most of the community here is familiar with tachography, so I'm not going to uh, describe that. Today, you can you know, measure in the order of a millimeter square at 10 nanometer resolution in a few hours. After the upgrade, that's expected to be on the order of a centimeter square at approximately 10 nanometer resolution in a day or two. Um, and I like to make the analogy, this is the equivalent of mapping out the entire land area of the United States at few meter resolution. 
um, except that, you know, instead of taking a simple image at every spot, you have to solve this complex um, inverse problem, which is phase retrieval. And so phase retrieval, as many of you know, is an iterative process, right? Um, you apply certain constraints in, in real space, you apply um, some constraints in reciprocal space, and you essentially do a lot of Fourier transforms 2D or 3D um, to recover the, the real space image. And the challenge of this is that you do have to do a lot of um, FFTs, complex to complex FFTs. Um, you need hundreds of thousands of iterations, and you typically also need to have many different starts to get high fidelity data because you could get trapped in local minima. It's a non-smooth um, surface that you're trying to converge to. And it's often very sensitive to the choice of, um, of, of um, hyperparameters that tune your phase retrieval algorithms, like which algorithms, how many iterations of each algorithm, um, how to apply the, the constraints and so on. And this is kind of like an expert um, knowledge, right? The, it takes a lot of uh, time to build up the expertise required to do successful phase retrieval. So our approach has been to essentially replace iterative phase retrieval um, with neural network methods that essentially learn to solve this inverse problem of, of diffraction data to sample amplitude and image in a single shot. So in the case of tychography, for example, um, you know, you acquire a lot of overlapping data that provides you the, the oversampling required to recover the loss phase information. You run this through an iterative engine of some sort and you get um, sample amplitude and phase when you're done. In our approach, we essentially learn a mapping from one single diffraction pattern that you have measured from one scan location to what that sample amplitude and phase would look like. So it's a single shot mapping from this to this. And so we don't explicitly use the overlap information in any way, um, but it's used implicitly in the generation of training data and so on. So because this is not no longer an iterative process, it's just one single shot, you just give the, once you've trained the network like this, you give the diffraction data to the neural network and you essentially get out a prediction of what the amplitude and phase look like. This approach is you know, hundreds of times faster um, than tra traditional iterative methods, and you also require significantly um, less data to do this. So um, this kind of process has been, um, this, this, this approach to addressing the problems of phase retrieval has been widely studied by a lot of different people. And here are just a few examples from literature. Um, so, you know, this example is from electron microscopy from John Wei Miao and others. Um, this is from optical microscopy, I think. Um, here's another example from, you know, single shot tychography. Um, this is from Esther and Xia Jing and others at Brookhaven um, doing this for x-rays. And all these examples, basically, you will see different approaches to replacing iterative phase retrieval with neural networks that learn to solve the inverse problem in a single shot. And so what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides is um, how to implement these sort of approaches on high rate instruments that we have at the APS um, and how we can get essentially real time instrument uh, images from these instruments. I'll talk about specifically um, how we need to develop instrument specific or, or technique specific solutions to some of these um, challenges. So our workflow the APS um, looks something like this, and this animation kind of shows how it works. So it is a bit complicated, so I'll take some time to break this down. So this portion of the animation represents the acquisition of the instrument. So you have a focus zone plate scanning a um, sample. You measure um, the diffraction in, in the, the current diffraction in the far field. You acquire a sequence of these images, right, as you scan to the sample. We move these images to a high performance um, cluster, uh, Polaris, or anything else. Um, and we then do phase retrieval. And I'll come back to why we still why we still do phase retrieval. When you're done with doing phase retrieval, you're essentially left with some training data that you can now do supervised training on. What I mean by that is you have the diffraction data. You also have the images that you have obtained by doing conventional phase retrieval. So you can use that to essentially do distributed training on a high performance computing. Um, resource. So you take the diffraction data, you take the phase retrieval images, you give it to a neural network and say, um, learn the mapping from this input diffraction to what the sample looks like. When you do that, you're left with essentially a trained model, which we then push to an edge computing device that sits at the beamline. 
this edge computing device is responsible for the live inference that the user sees. So essentially, the, the acquired data is split into two streams. One goes to the high performance computer, one goes to this edge computing device, and this edge computing device that is running a copy of the trained neural network makes a prediction, uh, makes a near instantaneous prediction of what the um, sample image looks like. Right? And so the reason we're still doing phase retrieval is because we're constantly updating the copy of the neural network. Right? Samples change, um, the instrument drifts over time, and so we want the network to have the latest um, information as part of its training. Um, but this kind of breaks the, the dependence on phase retrieval for real-time imaging. So right now, if phase retrieval takes half an hour or one hour, that's okay, because how we get the images to the user is through these live, um, the live inference is through the neural network running on the edge computing device. And so the phase, when phase retrieval is done, a new copy of the network comes to this device. But if that doesn't happen, you can still use the old um, copy of the network uh, for some time at least. And so using this approach, you've essentially been able to do you know, live inference on two kilohertz um, data stream on, on 128 by 128 detector images. And we were essentially um, bandwidth limited to one gigabyte per second. Essentially, a detector computer's um, network card couldn't handle more than this, and which is why we tapped out of this. In principle, we could go um, even faster um, and, and for larger images. So here's a, a recording of the Beamline computer um, while this is happening. So this is the, the data that you acquire. The, um, you can see the uh, diffraction data and some of the underlying structure from the zone plate. This is the live inference from the neural network. So the neural network gets this image and then immediately predicts what this should look like. And then the image on the bottom is a stitching of this as the scan progresses. So this is the scan location and is going across. Um, it's, it's, it's doing it in a format spiral. And this is the cumulative image obtained by stitching all of these scan locations um, and the predictions from the neural network together. So to kind of summarize um, this portion of the talk without high performance computing, you know, we're talking about days or weeks to do the, the phase retrieval and, and image reconstruction, and you kind of need the full data set. With high performance computing and essentially scaling out um, this phase retrieval problem uh, for typography to many, many GPUs, we can cut the reconstruction time to you know, minutes to hours. Um, but with this hybrid approach where we have both high performance computing and a trained neural network running on, edge, on an edge instrument, we can cut the reconstruction time to the order of um, milliseconds. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to a different um, current imaging technique for, um, in this case, Bragg CDI, kind of to make a contrast between um, how we approached tychography and how we approached um, BCDI and, and, and why we did it. And also highlight something that we're doing more and more, which is to um, incorporate prior physics knowledge into our, our neural network um, architecture and our machine learning solutions. So in, in 3D BCDI, um, similar to tychography, we're solving the phase retrieval problem, except in this case, we, you know, measure, we directly measure a small um, volume of reciprocal space around a Bragg peak. And so we want to do essentially then reconstruct the full 3D um, image of the of a, of a nanoparticle or a single grain in a polycrystalline material. So we essentially want to solve a 3D to 3D um, inverse problem as opposed to tachography, which you're doing 2D images uh, and stitching them later. So in this case, again, we have a you know network that um, in this case a 3D convolutional neural network that learns this mapping from um, reciprocal space information. Uh, reciprocal space data directly to sample amplitude and phase. And again, once trained, you do this in a single shot. Um, the difference with this network is that unlike in tychography, where you have to do supervised training, that is where you need images of both the diffraction data and the sample um, 
images to, to train the neural network. In this case, by incorporating essentially um, known physics, that is the forward scattering um, model, we can train this new neural network in a completely unsupervised manner. And so the way that works is you have some input diffraction data. Um, you pass it through this untrained neural network. It makes a prediction of what the image should look like. Um, initially, this is a terrible image, but that's okay. What we do is then we, you know, we take the, the object amplitude and phase, generate the complex number, and pass it through a forward model. So essentially do you know, some support constraint. Um, we do a 3D FFT, do some normalization, and get what the, what the estimated um, um, diffraction uh, data should look like. You then compare that to the input diffraction image, compute a loss function, and then use that to update the network weights. So in this entire sample loop, you never have to actually show the network images of the sample of, of what the actual particle looks like. All you need is the data that you've already collected at the instrument. Um, all the 3D BCDI data that you've collected over you know, 10 years, 15 years, or so on. And you can imagine how attractive this is to us because this just means that by collecting more experimental data, so just as the instrument keeps operating, we can acquire more and more experimental data, which we can use to train more and more accurate neural networks in the future in a completely um, autonomous fashion. Um, so the network gets better and better, um, and it's done you know, in a completely unsupervised manner. And essentially, you know, so to kind of reiterate, we eliminate the need for ground truth um, images and training. So in principle, you will never have to do phase retrieval again. So here are some results from this network. So the top row is, is phase retrieval, um, and the middle row is the raw prediction from the neural network, and the bottom row is what happens when um, you take the prediction from the neural network, and you run a few iterations of phase retrieval. So initially, if you had to run 100 iterations of phase retrieval, now you just run like 10 iterations of phase retrieval. Um, and in and the chi-square error is listed here. In this case, chi, lower chi-square is, is better. So um, although the images in the neural, from the raw neural network prediction look very good, um, the chi-square error is a little higher. But if we do this kind of hybrid approach where we take the neural network prediction, run a few iterations of phase retrieval, um, you not only end up being faster, but you also end up with lower um, chi-square error and the images look, um, as you can see, um, in some cases, even superior to phase retrieval, which often ends up with some artifacts in there. Okay. Um, and of course, we are a user facility. And um, one of the things that we you know, really care about is making this available to our um, users. So our, in this case, the, the autophase NN model is now incorporated into production software that the users use while they're operating the instrument and also can take home with them um, for their data analysis. So this is a package called Cohere that Barbara Frosik and Ross Harder have been developing over some years. And essentially, you know, you do, you, there's options to a lot of data preparations, um, pre-processing of the data display and so on. But you also have the option now of choosing this neural network prediction um, instead of a random guess or a flat guess when you start your phase retrieval. And so when you do that, essentially you can get, um, um, in this case, you know, this was phase retrieval run for 600 iterations. It took so much amount of time. Essentially you'll see um, Yudong who recorded this video, she cuts, you know, she just runs 50 iterations of, of ER when you start with a neural network prediction. And um, in, you know, in a fraction of the time that you take to run uh, phase retrieval from the beginning, you have a good um, reconstruction. And if the video plays out a little more, you can see a comparison between the different um, reconstructed images, starting with uh, phase retrieval run as in the past versus phase retrieval run, uh, which starting with the neural network, yes.
So the three things that you see here are essentially uh, phase retrieval, the, the raw neural network guess, and this one, which is a combination that you start the neural network on a few iterations of phase retrieval. Um, and you can see this um, produces a very pleasing um, image. Which also, which we can also quantify with the chi-square error and see that it's, it's the best possible reconstruction, um, even better than phase retrieval, while being faster. Okay, so I showed two examples um, of networks that we're uh, deploying at the APS. One is um, Tycho NN, um, and one was Autoface NN. So this was for tychography. Um, this was for 3D BCDI. And I showed two different approaches, essentially, um, to how we train these networks, right? With Tycho NN, we did this in a supervised manner. We did it in line with the experiment. With Autoface NN, it's done unsupervised, so essentially learns by itself how to do phase retrieval. Um, and it's trained in an offline manner. And the reason we approach this is because we're essentially governed by engineering criteria. For tychography, you're acquiring a lot of data sequentially very quickly, right? You're running a detector very fast. With um, BCDI, it typically takes a few minutes because you have to um, get a full 3D data set, which means involving, um, you know, physically rocking the sample stage. So inference times, for, for BCDI don't have to be so high. If you can do it in the order of a second or so, you know, that's plenty. Um, whereas for tychography, you basically have to be able to get inference from a neural network at the same speed that you're running a detector, right? Otherwise you just keep ending up with a backlog of images coming, from, coming in from your detector. So this means that our network sizes in turn are also governed by this, this requirement on uh, inference time. So for Tycho NN, that means having parameter, having a very small network. Um, we essentially um, quantize, prune, and make the network as small as possible so that we can keep inference time really low. With Autopaste and NN, since this is not a criteria, we can train a large network. We can train a network with more than 10 million parameters. Um, and this in turn has uh, consequences on how we can how these networks generalize. With Tycho NN, because it's so small, it is basically only good for this instrument um, and this sample. With autophase NN, this is a generalizable network. It's large, it, it gets to learn more things. And so it basically you know, is good for um, convex objects with weak phase. And now we're working on extending this basically to uh, more complex objects with like defects in them. So they have a lot of strong phase in them. And in principle, this would mean, you know, increasing the size of the network to make it um, capable of essentially of learning a broader space. So um, I talk a lot about current imaging, but that's not the only um, kind of technique where we are applying the sort of philosophy of um, training on high performance computing and deploying on, on edge computing devices. This is um, a network called Bragg and N that Saint Jun Louis, who's now at Amazon, um, Heman Sharma, who is in the CXX group, um, and many others at the APS um, have developed. And this is a neural network that um, essentially does very accurate uh, peak fitting for high energy diffraction microscopy. And so um, um, it's essentially a convolution neural network that takes uh, patches of the detector um, and then predicts to a very high subpixel accuracy what the peak location is. And this network is um, you know, 200 times faster and more accurate than current um, pseudo void approaches that have been used to, to do peak fitting. And just like with, with tychography, um, essentially you, they've deployed this network on an edge computing device um, to process streaming data. So you read the data right off the detector. Um, so here's a video of that happening. Um, you can identify the peaks and then you know, fit those to high, high, peak, um, high accuracy. Okay, so um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, how you know this this real time analysis that AI enables, in turn, lets us do more exciting things with instruments. Um, in particular, how we can start um, steering these experiments to to, in, to target uh, features that we're interested in. And this solves a a more general problem, right? So you put a sample and you don't know what's in the sample. And the question that we typically face when we start an experiment is, is how should you acquire data so as to maximize the, the information game in a minimal amount of time? 
And so in the approach that I'm going to show, what we do is we sample a few points initially randomly. And then we pre-train a network that essentially kind of learns um, where to sample from, given a, given a set of measurements, where to sample from so as to uh, maximize this information gain. Um, and I'll show, again, you know, we put this in the loop in the experiment um, so that the decisions are made very fast and the instrument is steered uh, very quickly uh, uh, to target locations. And essentially, we can, you know, use this approach to reconstruct images with far fewer points than you could um, if you were to do this um, in, a, in a high fidelity um, raster scan or other kind of, kind of, kind of fixed scan. So the particular um, sample is um, a tungsten diselenide film, and we measured the signal at the O8 Bragg peak in a scanning diffraction modality um, at the nanoprobe beam line at the APS. So um, this is kind of like how our edge setup looks like. Um, this is for tachography as well. I guess I didn't show the image earlier. Um, so this is looking upstream at, at one of our uh, beam lines. So we put, we use this um, uh, NVIDIA Jetson um, mini computer. So sort of like a, think of it like a Raspberry Pi, except it comes with, you know, CUDA cores and um, the ability to run very fast neural network inference. Um, it's inexpensive, it's low power, um, and it's sufficient to keep up um, with a lot of our, computer, our edge computing needs when it's running a trained neural network. Um, and our workflow goes something like this. So, you know, you sample a few points randomly, you, um, we have this trained neural network that essentially then suggests the next 50 most important points to sample from. We run some root optimization through Google's OR tools to optimize the scan path over 50 points. Um, we acquire those points, we compute a change in the image, um, and then loop backwards um, to figure out again the next set of points um, from that the neural network suggests to sample. So all of this is in a completely automated fashion. So you know, your user will start the scan here. Um, and then this cycle will continue until um, the change in the image is um, minimal and you're done with the scan. The cool thing about what we did was we trained this neural network on an utterly unrelated image. Um, it's this famous image of a cameraman. And essentially it was trained on um, 100 different masks um, at different sampling rates. So, you know, we block out different portions of the, of the image the neural network has to learn where to sample from so as to get closest to the, to the actual ground truth image. And this is an approach that we have essentially adapted from this paper um, from uh, people at Argonne and from Charlie Bowman at, at Purdue. And these are the results from that. So the, on the left, you have the full resolution image that you would have acquired if you were to measure every single scan location. And this is an image that was taken at 100 nanometer stamp set. The results on the right show the corresponding image if you were to, own, if you were to use this um, AI guided acquisition approach. The plot on the bottom right shows the locations that were chosen by this neural network to scan. So you kind of see it starts focusing on um, edges of features where things are changing the most. And it ignores uh, portions of the sample that are relatively flat, but there's not a lot going on. And so this is the image um, that's acquired with, you know, like 20, 25% um, of the number of scan points as this image. And you can see it acquires in all of the features um, in the image. So again, here's a video of this um, running at a beamline. So this is um, the sector 26 beamline at the APS. Um, and this is a live recording of, of the computer. So the bottom row is the points that are measured by the neural network. The, Image here is the interpolated um, image, um, and I think the text will walk you through the rest of the video. Oh yeah, so this little red dot is the live location of where the beam is, and this um, path in white is um, an optimized route through all of the points that the neural network suggests is the most important to sample from. And this is the live detector image. So 
So you see it discovered a new feature and so spends more time measuring around it um, just to make sure it gets all of the aspects of that feature. Um, we can also do this sort of automation in, in experimental and, and, and um, intelligence steering of instruments, not just for the experimentation side, but also for the instrumentation side. And so Luca Rabafi in the optics group and Sagat Kandl and others um, have been working on this thing called autofocus, essentially the idea being um, how can you automate the process of you know, alignment and focusing of of mirrors, um, and they're doing this by essentially working with a digital twin of the beamline um, in this uh, modeling software called Oasis. So they develop a lot of these models in, in simulation, and then you can deploy these um, in instruments, and they've been getting uh, very good results for this. Um, other related work, um, people like Yin San, Nikita Kuklev, Ihar Lobak, and others at the APS, they're looking at um, AI-based steering of the accelerator itself. Um, and they're looking at AI applied to um, increasing the efficiency of the operation and also being able to predict um, things like power trips ahead of time. Okay, so with that, um, I reached the end of my talk. Um, I hope I've convinced you that um, um, AI would be an integral part of um, APSU beamlines. We talked about um, AI for analysis and I showed some examples of how we can um, accelerate and essentially allow real-time imaging uh, for the first time, um, showed an example of um, autonomously steering the microscope um, to features of interest that we're interested in. Um, and this one I've not talked about today in the interest of time, but you know, more long term, um, we're interested in learning physics directly from the data that we measure. Um, we're, and again, um, putting these into production is, is integral to what we do. Writing the papers only um, part of it. Um, this is going, and, and some of our AI for analysis techniques already going into production, like we saw in the next few years. We expect um, some of our um, steering models to go into production as well, and a lot more long term. We hope to see some of our AI for knowledge models in production. All of our code, data, trained models, everything is um, freely available and always will be. And you're welcome to try these out and let us know if you have any issues. Thank you, and with that, I'll take any questions.